Welcome into another episode of Golden Sombrero. I'm Dominic Stern, joined by Cole Bradley and Ryan Blake, my dear friends. We're here to talk about some high quality baseball. How are you guys doing this morning? Pretty good. Doing good, right? Talk some baseball. Oh, yeah. We're going to start the show off like we always do with our Golden Sombreros of the week. Our last recording was uh, just over a week ago. So we got just over a week of baseball content to talk about. Uh, first Golden Sombrero on. September 2nd was Omar Narvaez, catcher for the Brewers against the Detroit Tigers. We got on the 4th, Tampa Bay Rays shortstop, who's actually having a really good offensive year, Willie Adamas against, uh, oh, I don't know who that was against. I wrote down the wrong team. Uh, then on the 5th, we actually had a couple of golden sombreros on the 5th. We got young outfielder for the Rockies, Sam Hilliard, against the Dodgers. We got Gary Sanchez, who just can't hit anything right now against the Baltimore Orioles, Sandy Leone against the Milwaukee Brewers. And then to wrap that up, we had Matt Chapman get a platinum sombrero against the San Diego Padres. I remember watching that. I was like, oh, he's got four. Let's see if you get five. He actually struck out in seven straight at-bats in that series, uh, five on Saturday and then twice on Sunday before getting pulled because he frankly just wasn't doing anything. Then on the sixth, we had two in the same game, Alec Bohm, uh, Rookie third baseman for the Phillies against New York Mets. And then Wilson Ramos, catcher for the Phillies, or catcher for the Mets against the Phillies. Then on the eighth, we have Austin Meadows, slugging outfielder for the Rays against the Washington Nationals. Eugenio Suarez on the ninth against the Cubs. Monty Harrison, young outfielder for the Miami Marlins against the Braves. And Ian Happ on the tenth to wrap us up against the Reds. So, yeah, those are our golden sombreros. Of the week had a platinum sombrero in there as well. I believe that's two platinum sombreros on the year, him and Michael Chavis. So, you know, pit, pitchers stay winning. They always do, guys, right? Yep, that's the life of a pitcher. Can't say it better. They, they just have been more dominant this year with strikeouts, and it's just showing with the amount of golden sombreros we have and the amount of platinum sombreros we've had. Right, there should never be an excuse to have a platinum spray. You got to put the ball in play once, but happens. So we, we normally follow this up by talking about our teams next. Uh, I figured I'd open the floor up to you guys. Do you guys want to do this? Because uh, for you guys, it keeps getting more miserable. But for me, it's just awesome. I'll talk about the Diamondbacks a little bit. I mean, you know, it, it, with a season like this, you have to appreciate – you know, the small victories, you know, the little things that go right. Um, and, you know, on the bright side, we've won two in a row. Uh, we beat the Dodgers in the series finale and uh, arguably Madison Bumgarner's uh, best start of the year. Um, he did only go five innings. and He did once again give up back-to-back -back home runs. But you know what? He did his job and he kept the game – he kept it close and he put us in a position to win. And, um, we took that one. Bullpen was good too. And then last night's game against uh, the Seattle Mariners was the debut for uh, Caleb Smith, and he was on an innings limit because he's coming off of injury. Um, and he did pretty well. He only pitched three innings. He did give up a run, but he did, he did pretty solid, and he looked pretty good in his, in his debut. And, again, the bullpen did a nice job as well. And, yeah, so two in a row. Um, but aside from that, you know, it's been, it's been pretty abysmal. It's, and it's, it's shocking. You know, I talked about it last time. It's shocking how – inconsistent this team has been and um, really just how poor the season has gone since really their um, the end of their homestand against the open days which seems like um, a year ago honestly it just it feels like it's been an eternity but you know you take what you can get and at this point again you're just kind of trying to appreciate the small victories like i said and so that's that that's they've won two in a row so that's pretty cool you know i'm actually really happy with the royals right now uh they were on a seven game losing streak but now they've won four in a row including three straight wins against cleveland and against to end the season series which is huge i didn't think that they would win that series and they ended up taking the final three games to win it that was their first series win in over a month they had not won a series. They had struggled heavily. I also just want to say that I hate Austin Hedges very much 
for breaking up Brady Singer's no hitter after seven and two thirds. Austin, I, I mean, Dom, I hate Austin Hedges. Well, I had to watch him attempt to hit a baseball for several years. So, uh, you know, we, we have our different reasons for not liking him. Uh, I personally liked him as a player. I thought he brought a lot of value to the team, especially behind the plate. But dude can't hit. But when a no hitter is oh, yeah. on the line, I guess it's different. Yeah, he can't hit. Yeah, I know he can't hit until there's four outs until a no hitter, and he just gets a bloop single. He's just proven the point that he's the best player on the field at any given moment. Exactly, Cole. <laughs> the dude finds a way to have a positive war just by hitting like 180 on the season. Pathetic. Um, yeah, it, so frustrating. It, it's pathetic, Ryan. I know. I, I watched him for multiple years. And there there was at one point where he was a fan favorite amongst Padres fans. It, it was that rough. But but now we're here. Slam Diego. Padres have won 18 of the last 23 games. But, of course, what happens? COVID-19 happens. A giant player tested positive yesterday for COVID-19. And because of that, the Padres, they have to postpone their current series against San Francisco Giants which hopefully doesn't halt all momentum because winning 18 out of 23, the Dodgers are coming to town later this week, and, and all of a sudden we can't play for three straight days, and it's like, oh, man. The last time the Padres were in playoff contention, 2010, the Giants spoiled that for us. This year, it could be the same exact thing. If our momentum gets killed because of this, I'm going to be upset. But it is most important that the players stay healthy, that uh, the player who tested positive – Recovers from COVID-19. It doesn't spread to anyone else. That's most important. But, man, uh, this is a worst nightmare for a Padres fan right now. So let's move on. Let's talk about uh, – we'll, we'll, we'll move into the standings first. Uh, we're going to make sure to get into uh, awards talk today. Uh, we were pretty quick in the beginning today as opposed to normal when we, we kind of ramble on about our teams. But today let's talk about the standings. As always, we start in the National League because that's where two of our teams lie. So, guys, the Braves, they still sit atop of the East, the Philadelphia Phillies. They're trying to get up there. And the same with the Chicago Cubs. I mean, we haven't seen much movement in the standings as of late. But the Cubs, the Brewers, they're within a couple of games of the Cubs. Not too much time left. And the Padres, only three and a half games back of the Dodgers. Do we see any of these division leaders changing over the course of the next two weeks? Um, I think it might be close. I think the only um, the only possible the possi- only possibility I really see here is maybe in the East, but the Braves are probably one of the hottest teams in baseball, and um, their offense and their lineup just continues to pour on um, an excess amount of runs, it's seemingly like every game. Um, that's the only one I can really – I can really see changing. I don't see really any of these teams losing momentum, though. Um, but, yeah, that's the way I see it. I think for the Braves, they have struggled heavily on the road. They're only 500 on the road while they're 15-8 and eight at home. And their next nine games are on the road. So I think that's something to watch, especially going against a Mets team that's playing really well. Of course, they're going against the Nationals, who have struggled this year, and the Orioles. So these are games that they should win. But they're not playing good baseball on the road, and I think that that's something to watch out for come playoff time. For the Dodgers, Dom, I'm sorry, no chance of winning that division. No shot. I the mean, there's not, there's not no shot. The, the Dodgers come to town for three games this week. If the Padres find a way to win that series, they, they split the season series, which is what the Padres need. Uh, and then if they sweep them, they win the season series, and all of a sudden they're they're only one game back. So I'm not saying that's going to happen, but you're saying it's impossible. And the way the Padres are playing right now, that nothing's impossible. But here's the thing. I think that COVID in this situation is going to have an effect on them. I really do. And so that's just what that's, – that's what I think on it. Again, I could be 100% wrong. I just think that this is the week – where the Dodgers take over and kind of end your chances of getting the division. That's what I'm saying. Right. I don't think there's a big difference for the Padres between winning the division and 
being that number four seed because either way you're going to have to face the Dodgers in the second round. Both teams will win their first series. It's just all about would you rather face the Phillies or the Cardinals or the Giants or the Marlins. And obviously you want to face the Giants and the Marlins because those two teams aren't as good as the Phillies and the Cardinals. But either way, you're going to be facing the Dodgers in the second round if you move on. So it's not a huge difference. It's just being able to say you were NL West division champions, yeah. which the Potters haven't said since 2006. Which Nobody's is the been able to say other than the Dodgers since 2013. Yes, in 2013. So Dodgers have run that division. I think it's going to be the same way. Next year could be a different story, but this year I think the Dodgers kind of put the nail in the coffin this week. But I think the most interesting division to watch right now is the Central, especially with the Cardinals being far behind on games. They've only played 38 games. They've got some games to make up, and I know it goes by win percentage if you don't face if you don't play all 60 games so it's going to be interesting to see how it all shakes out at the end uh i am officially off the reds hype train they've disappointed and you've seen sunny gray and trevor Bauer start to slip a little bit so i'm off that hype train and maybe maybe me saying that will get them to start winning so but i think that the Cardinals have a chance to overcome the Cubs if they start to struggle. Yeah, and the, the Reds are – we all knew they were a team that were going to play better in a full 162-game season because of that rotation. But in that 60-game rotation – or in that 60-game season, you haven't been able to see the bats totally get hot yet. Uh, like you mentioned, Sonny Gray, Luis Castillo, they, they haven't been as good as we expected them all to be. And then Trevor Bauer with his hot start – He's, he's cooled off. He's still amongst the league best for still NL. Very good, though. Still yes. Very good. Uh, especially with his last start against the Cubs. I think he went seven and two thirds scoreless. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he looked good. Yeah. They they just haven't been able to put it all together like almost everyone thought they would. And in a 162 game season, you have more time. But of course, that's not the way that 2020 is. And they're, they're five and a half games out. They're a couple of games out of a playoff spot. Uh, I, they're the best team that's not in second place in their division. I think we all know that, but they certainly aren't playing like it. And that they got to act quickly if they want to be able to get into the playoffs and sneak in, because if they sneak in as the eight or the seven seed, uh, they're, they're not going to be an easy out for sure. No, that lineup is dangerous. And like we've all said from the beginning, they have a terrific starting rotation and that bullpen got better by acquiring Archie Bradley. So they've got to get going quick. And I, and if they can, this team could make a lot of noise in the playoffs. Certainly could, but got to get there, and it doesn't seem like they are. Uh, it's going to be really interesting for me to see if the Braves can hold off the Phillies and the Marlins because the Braves, they've suffered an injury to Max Freed over the last week, who has been far and away their best starting pitcher this year. He's really been one of their only good pitchers this year. So someone's going to have to step up in his absence just to – give them innings so their bullpen doesn't have to get torched because they're a playoff team this year. There's no doubt about that. They're going to get in whether or not they win the division or if they get second place. But the starting pitching staff needs to find a way to not get the bullpen super taxed heading into the postseason because we saw last year the bullpen was peaking at the right time, but then Chris Martin got injured while warming up going into the playoff game. And at that point, the bullpen just fell apart. They ended up losing that series in five games. If you ask me, they would have won that series easily with Barton. But they also suffered an injury to Ronald Acuna Jr. yesterday on Friday. And it didn't look good. He fouled the ball off of his ankle, and he basically had to get carried off the field. So it uh, hasn't been announced whether or not he's going on the injured list or not. Uh, if he does, it's another huge blow to his offense. He's really starting to heat up for the Braves. Uh, their, their lineup has been killing it with the additions of uh, Adam Duvall and Marcelo Zuna just in the middle, the bottom half of that order to complement Freddie Freeman, Ozzy Albies, Dansby Swanson, and of course Acuna Jr. So I think they'll be fine in that aspect, but the, the starting pitching staff is going to have to need to step up for sure. Yeah, I agree with you, Dom. The one thing that's really hurt them the past couple of years has been that starting rotation that they haven't had constant strong production. And you saw their their best pitcher last season – Terry's Achilles with Michael Soroka earlier in the year. So that hurts them going into the playoffs. And we talked about this earlier saying that it does, but 
what this will be Acuna's second stint on the IL. And they still found a way to win games without him. Like you said, that lineup is terrific. Mark Yankees is back. Marcelo Zuna, Swanson, Albies, Austin Riley even, Freddie Freeman. There's a ton of terrific bats in that lineup that can make up for the loss of Acuna. But you, well, first and foremost, you need to make sure he's healthy going into the playoffs. So if that means sitting him for a week or two to get a fully healthy Ronald Acuna Jr. for the playoffs, I think it's worth it. Well, but you also want to figure yeah. out – here, Joel, you go. Yeah, sorry about that. I made a YouTube video about uh, recapping the trade deadline a couple weeks ago, and one of the teams I highlighted in there as one of the losers was the Braves. Um, they did get Tommy Malone at the deadline, but, you know, we've talked about it since, you know, Soroka went down. They've needed starting pitching, and, you know, one man, and that one man being really Max Freed, um, can only do so much. And, I mean, it's really it's really coming to fruition now. You know, it just goes to show how much this deadline is already kind of coming back to bite them. You know, they weren't aggressive enough in going and getting Mike Clevenger. You know, they missed out on him. You know, they could have got a, uh, made an offer for Lance Lynn. They didn't get him. They could have done something for Mike Miner. You know, something. Just, you know, you need hel- you need healthy arms, healthy, experienced arms in your rotation. That's what you would like, um, especially – um, during a heated push for the postseason. And then just in the postseason, you know, you need good starting pitching. You know, we talk about it all the time. And their inability to um, go out and get somebody um, solid at the deadline is really already coming back to hurt them. So I think that's that's a huge part of this. And we all knew that when, again, when Soroka went down, starting pitching was going to be a huge concern. And, you know, here we are. Yeah. And Ronald Cunha Jr. is going to need to be healthy for this team to make a playoff run. He's also going to need to get some reps in before getting to the playoffs. And he's going to need to be performing. The Braves are a huge wild card in the NL because I feel like they're either the second or the third best team in the National League, depending on whether or not you put them in front or behind the San Diego Padres. The Dodgers are the clear-cut number one, but the Braves, when they're hot, they're they're arguably as good as the as the Dodgers. So let's move to the American League. Uh, it looks like the Tampa Bay Rays they're going to win the East. Uh, Toronto Blue Jays currently a half game in front of New York Yankees. Bo Bichette expected to be activated today. That's a huge uh, another bat in that lineup that's already been performing well. But the more bats, the better. It's just going to help the bottom of the order even more. In the Central, this division just remains just awesome. Chicago White Sox are on top. Uh, None of us really expected that. I know you guys were higher on them than I was coming into the year, but we all certainly expected the Twins to win the division. They got a one-game lead over the Twins right now. And the Cleveland Indians, who have lost four straight, courtesy of Ryan's Royals, are currently in. It was three. It was three straight. They won the first game. Yeah, but the the Indians have lost four straight, and you guys. Okay, Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 But yes, you the Royals are a big part of that. And now the Indians find themselves two and a half games out of first place. They would be uh they would be that wild card team. That's not where you want to be. You want to be playing in that middle. And then out west, Oakland. They got a seven game lead over the Houston Astros. That's unbelievable. The Astros they've been sliding. Uh you you hear words from Zach Ranke saying, like, hey, we're in the playoffs anyways. Who cares? It's kind of very Zach Ranke. Uh, he's, he's, he's one of a kind. Those are, those are true Zach Ranky comments. And, uh, I mean, I don't feel like we have to do much talking about, uh, these divisions except for the central and possibly the Yankees and Blue Jays. But what do you guys make of the American league? For me last show, I said that I thought Toronto at some point was going to overcome the Yankees for second place for at least a part of the season for the rest of the way. I'm not saying they're going to stick that way, but I think the Yankees, they're starting to get healthier. They're starting to play a lot better after falling to 21 and 20, I believe. And now they're 24 and 21. They're starting to play a lot better. They put on the clinic yesterday, hitting two home runs in the first inning against the Orioles. So I expect them to get back to second place and finish in second while the Blue Jays are a wild card team. Mainly because... I think that the Blue Jays, despite getting Bo Bichette back, they got 
killed last night by the Mets. I didn't see the final score, but in like the seventh inning, I saw it was 17 to one. The Mets dominated them. So I I think the Yankees are trending up while the Blue Jays are starting to trend down a little bit. So I have the Yankees finishing in second while the Rays are taking that division. They've been terrific despite all of those injuries that they've had to endure. Yeah, Tampa Bay has been really good. I um, We talked a lot about them in our season preview, and I know a lot of us or pretty much all of us were – high on them, but we all thought that the Yankees were the clear cut favorite in this division. But again, like, you know, as it is, as it is seemingly every year for New York, it's the injuries that just catch up to them. And, you know, they haven't consistently been able to keep guys healthy and that's always been a detriment for them. And, but it's shocking to see how Toronto is as good as they are. And again, they're just, cap- I think they're capitalizing on the fact that this is a short year and that they're just, they're just performing well at the right time. And that lineup looks really good. And, I mean, they did get absolutely destroyed last night. But, you know, sometimes that happens. And um, I, I don't know. I just have really I've really been shocked at the way that division's actually kind of panned out. I mean, I didn't even expect the Red Sox to be as bad as they are. I mean, they're, I knew they were going to be bad, but they're, like, bad. Um, it's just crazy to think that um, this division has shaped out the way it's been. And I think it's a product of this short year, you know. Again, any any team can really perform or, you know, get hot. And then next thing you know, you're like one of the top two, top three um, teams in your division. And then you're a playoff team. But I don't know. It's just been surprising. I think we do have to show a little love to the AL West. Um, I mean, a seven-game lead over the Astros for the A's is something that – I don't know if anyone would have predicted that. I mean yeah. – you know, it's it's one thing to predict Oakland as division winners, but by seven games, that's that's not. I mean, like you just you, you can't, especially for a team like Houston, which again, I mean, they're cheaters, but they're good. It's a good lineup. I think this right. past weekend when the A's and Astros went at it, that was huge for them mm-hmm. to increase that lead. That was huge. Yeah, no, it was. Yeah, Oakland Oakland has just proven that they're um, far and away the better team this year. I mean, they've. They've come out and they've shown off their power. You know, they've, you know, they've shown off some of their young talent. I mean, Jesus Lazardo looks pretty good. Um, This is a team that, you know, as always, is just consistent every year. And, but this is, they're taking that next step, I think. And again, one of those teams just capitalizing with shortened season and, you know, making sure that they're, that they're staying consistent and staying good when they need to. So um, that's my thoughts. I want to bounce a feeling of mine off you guys. Personally, I see the A's as kind of a Braves-like team in the AL because they have very inconsistent production from the starting pitching staff, but that lineup can hit super well, and their bullpen is very solid. Do you guys agree Uh, with me, or am I insane? I think you're you're kind of mixing it up. I think the starting pitching staff is kind of what is the glue – to the, to the A's, I highlighted them coming into the season. Manaya hasn't been great this year, but as the of late... The starts has been good. Yeah, that's what I was... He's been really shaky. That's, that's what I was literally about to say, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, and so, uh, when the starting pitching staff gets going for them, we already highlighted Luzardo. He's been good. Uh, but the, the starting pitching staff has been what's kept the A's in it for a long time. And then now the bullpen has been elite for the past couple of years, and the lineup is finally turning it around. Matt Chapman, he's gone super cold. But Matt Olsen, the other Matt on the other side of the field, he's been getting hot lately, hit a grand slam the other day against, guess who, the Texas Rangers. Uh, They've allowed, I think, six grand slams on the season, which is pretty pitiful. Uh, But, you know, shout out to the A's. Uh, Ryan and now we did pick them to win the division, but I don't think either of us saw them winning it by seven games or having a seven-game yeah. lead in the middle of September. And then uh, you you got to give a shout-out to the Seattle Mariners. They only find themselves two and a half games behind the Houston Astros for that possible playoff spot. And if the Seattle Mariners somehow sneak in, that would be unbelievable. Yeah, the Astros are – they had gotten hot and had started playing a lot better – really getting close to the A's, and now the A's have just taken over. While the Astros have taken a huge step back, 
I don't think it's insane to think that the Mariners could go and take that spot. I think the loss of Verlander has had way bigger effects than I thought. And I don't know what – I personally think that it is becoming more and more likely that the Mariners could somehow sneak in and take that second spot in the division. Yep, and for, for the Central, we haven't talked about them much uh, on this episode, but do you guys see the White Sox holding on at the top, or do we see the Twins or the Indians overtaking them? I think, uh, I mean, the way they're playing right now, I think the White Sox probably hold on. I mean, they did, they're just really hot right now, and they've shown again why they, they've shown why they mean business this year. And, I mean, starting pitching hasn't been a huge issue, and, I mean, it doesn't – really need to be at all when you know you have an offense like they have um and so as long as you're providing run support for your starter you know you're always putting yourself in a good position to win the game and that's just what they've done and they've done it so well and um i don't know i i personally think they'll probably take it over the twins but minnesota obviously is a team that has the potential to um just sort of you know explode on you um and then rattle off, you know, some ungodly amount of wins at any given time. And this is as good of a time as any to do that. So we'll see. It's only a one game lead. So for me, looking at it, I think the White Sox are going to take this division. The White Sox have been so dominant the past month that I don't know if there's a team that could come in and just get hot enough to dethrone them. You've seen the Twins, they have the ability to do it. But I don't think they will. The Twins have struggled, and they lost first place in the division. We said earlier in the year that this was the Twins' division to lose, and they lost it. And I think that the White Sox are going to take first place in that division. While the Indians, I could see them, if they can get hot again, I could see them taking the second spot and the Twins falling to third. They have not been playing good baseball, and I think that these struggles might continue. Uh, I strongly disagree with what you said about the Twins losing the division. They're twenty-eight and eighteen. That's that's a great record. I mean, that's going to oh, win you the division. The they've played. Well, but you said it was their division well to lose. They've well, played well. Well, we said well, that so. earlier in the year, though. We said yeah, that but you said they lost. But you said they lost it. There, it was their division to lose, and they've lost it. They they're they're doing their job. The White Sox are just playing way better than anyone expected to. And a lot of the credit goes to the White Sox starting pitching staff, like Cole mentioned. Everyone expected Lucas Giolito to be good. He has been. Uh, I thought that with the loss of Michael Kopech, that's one less arm. But it turns out that Dylan Cease and Dallas Keuchel have really filled in for that role. And the starting pitching staff actually looks like a possible strength for them. Obviously, it's not as good as their lineup. That, that would just be a foolish statement to make. But when you look at their lineup, they're, they're seven, eight bats deep. They're a good team, and you do not want to face this team in the playoffs, whether they're the 78th seed, whether they're the 4 or the 5 seed, or if they're even possibly the 2 or the 3 seed. Because right now, the Oakland A's are the number one seed. One seed. American League, just a half game in front of the Tampa Bay Rays. White Sox come in at 3. Uh, AL Central is going to be so fun to watch over the course of the next two weeks. So, do we got anything else to talk about? Uh, in regards to the standings, or should we move on to our awards talk, which we had to delay a couple of weeks, but now that we're finally deeper into the season, it seems more reasonable to talk about. All right, let, let's move to our awards talk. So let, let's talk about the, oh, you know, screw it. Let's talk about the National League. Uh, talk about the National League first, because uh, let's talk about MVP first, because, uh, you know, it's my boy, Fernando Tatis Jr., uh, do you think Fernando Tatis Jr. is the front runner right now, and do you think he'll hold on for the rest of the year, which is just two weeks? Yeah, I think he's far and away probably been the best player, not only in the NL but probably in the entire league this year. He's just proven, you know, I, it's funny. I saw a lot of people coming into the season saying he was going to regress, and he's done everything but that. It's just kind of funny because all those people are just terribly wrong. Um, He's just so fun to watch. And, I mean, even if you're not a Padres fan, you have to love him because of the joy and, the, um, and you know, the human highlight reel aspect he's bringing to the game of baseball. You know, we haven't seen that in a player 
for a long time. I mean, Mike Trout comes to mind, but you know, Mike Trout is, you know, he's not as young as he used to be. He's not as young as Fernando Tatis Jr. is right now. And so he's sort of taking that new role as the most exciting player in baseball. And, you know, he's he's got the numbers to back it up as well. And so I think he's definitely the front runner and will probably, you know, win the award by a mile. I will say Mookie Betts has been sort of um, creeping up on him these past couple of weeks. Um, definitely a guy to keep your eye on. But I, I think Tatis is far and away – um, the the most deserving out of any MVP candidate in either league. Yeah, I you saw me a little get a little excited there because my MVP pick was Mookie Betts, but I don't think he'll catch him. Personally, I think Tatis has just been so incredible this year, making ha- plays in the field, hitting the ball terrifically. I don't. I think this year sh- has shown that the Padres have the best left side of the infield in the entire league with Machado and Tatis. I think close behind them is Arenado and Story. But those two... No brainer. Yeah. But those two with Machado and Tatis are two MVP candidates. And I think that the way that Tatis has just really led that... He's led that team heavily. And he's put so much pressure on himself, and he just keeps performing. He doesn't succumb to the pressure. He actually accepts it and dominates every single game. Definitely. He just makes it look easy. And, again, we talk, I talked a little bit about, like, excite, most exciting players in baseball. And, you know, he just brings this flair and this, um, this energy to baseball that we haven't really seen, that you don't see a lot. No, not necessarily we haven't, we haven't seen it, but um, you just don't see it a lot. It's very rare um, that a, a player of this caliber, you know, rises to the occasion um, of this, you know, face of baseball kind of mantra or whatever um, and runs with it. And he just he, – he, he's played – so consistently well over the course of this season that entire team has. And again, it's why they, they've sort of burst onto the scene is probably the most exciting team. Um, and not only the national league, but just, you know, in baseball. And so I think the Padres have single-handedly this year, almost grown the game in a way we haven't really seen before in a long time. It's, it's nice to sort of see, uh, things get, um, shaken up a little bit, you know, standings get shaken up a little bit, seeing new teams perform well, seeing new faces and, you know, sort of remixing things and making it fresh and new and exciting. And that's just exactly what, you know, the Padres are doing and that's exactly what he's doing. And so I think you got to give him all the credit, not all the credit, but I think you got to give him a lot of the credit for, you know, their success and for um, them being um, where they are. As I said last year, Dom has agreed with me, and not even just as a as a Padres fan, but as an observer of baseball. If Tatis did not get hurt last year, I think he would have won Rookie of the Year over Pete Alonso. Nothing against Pete Alonso. Yeah, absolutely. That's just how good Tatis is. He was just on pace for that, for yeah. sure, yeah. And, I mean, just and, looking at the numbers, you know, yeah. in, four, in 46 games, he's hit, he's hit 15 home runs, which I'm pretty sure is – I, I think he's leading the league in that category. He's got 40 yeah, runs driven. He's, in um, he's batting 303 with an OPS of over a thousand. He's, um, I know he. I don't know if he still does, but I remember a while back he at least had one of the highest highest average exit velocities um, yeah. in the entire league. I don't so, know if it's, and I know he had. I'm pretty sure for a while he was first in uh, hardest hit balls in. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. So, so he's sure making he that. Impact. Yeah. So, exactly. he's I, just been extremely good. I mean, and he has the numbers to back it up, and his consistency is insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's just been again. He's just been so good. There's really no other word to describe him besides uh, dominant, really. Right. And like I you just, said about mm-hmm. how he at, just is one of the most exciting players in baseball. I think he's the most exciting. That fire and passion he brings, especially, and I think. Despite the controversy with the Grand Slam being up seven runs on a 3-0 count, that just shows 
the intensity and the drive and how entertained this guy is. Because at any moment, he will make a pitcher pay and he will make a team pay. And I just love it. And I love that. Yeah, no, for sure. And then, I mean, you know, we talk about him, but um, just to show, I guess, you know, another guy, you know, I talked about Mookie Betts a little bit earlier. Um, I see him as sort of a runner up right now, considering how he's been performing lately. Uh, 14 home runs, 33 runs driven in. He's batting 301 with a 602 slugging percentage and a 983 OPS. So he's really adjusted well um, since, you know, becoming a Dodger and something you have to, I mean, he's just a good baseball player and it's hard not to, not to like him regardless of who he plays for. Um, And I think he's done such a nice job, you know, stepping in to a new environment and a new setting and, you know, really, taking the reins of, you know, being the star player. Cause Cody Bellinger hasn't been that good this year. You know, he's been, yeah, hitting he's, fallen off since under, yeah, he's, he's hitting, I think, I think he's been hitting under 250. He's only got 10 home runs this year. Like he's, he's far and he's definitely not their best player this season. And then, no, it's bets. Yeah. Mookie you, Betts saw, is, you saw Mookie struggle at the beginning. Mm-hmm. You expect that with an adjustment of period, especially moving from AL to NL. Cause you've seen that, with Eric Hosman the past couple of seasons, he's had trouble adjusting to the switch in leagues. But Mookie Beck, yeah. he turned it on. And he's just been terrific. Yeah, he's, he's just really, been to, he's picked yeah. up the lack of production from Bellinger this year. And no, I really think that Bellinger's going to turn it on come playoff time. Mm-hmm. But I, I think the Dodgers need to see more from him before the playoffs. Absolutely, but uh, yeah, again, Mookie, and I feel like it's part of the reason they got him is you know for for really any time that he isn't. Um, you know, a guy like Bellinger isn't performing up to expectation. You know, Betts is a guy who um, kind of picks up the slack a little bit, you know, as that extra MVP caliber kind of player who can, you know, always be the X factor at any given time. He's he's proven that, you know, again this year. And um, he's also got that postseason experience, so he's going to be really good for them as well come October. But – that's definitely another guy um, I think you can probably consider for um, the MVP. I think, again, it's Tatis. But then, you know, there's other names like Manny Machado has been really good this year, obviously, as well for the Padres. Um, Do you know who's actually been really good? I'm not saying he's a, he's in that top MVP candidate slot. But Michael Conforto has been terrific this year. Very good. Yes, he has. His, yeah. his bat has really been the catalyst in that Mets offense, especially since they started out rough. They're playing some good baseball right now. And he has a 343 average. He has nine home runs. He has 57 hits and 166 at bats. Yeah. He was playing really well. And he has really stepped up. And been a key part of that offense because Pete Alonso has not been Pete Alonso this year. No, exactly. Between Conforto and Cano, who's been hitting really well, those guys have made up for that lack of production from Alonso that we expected. A, we expected a lot from him after hitting 53 home runs last year. He's just not doing it right now. And Conforto is really stepping up. Absolutely. Um, and then – uh, Dom is having trouble getting back into the uh, stream here, and so he's texting me, telling me um, to, on his behalf, bring up Juan Soto as uh, his guy to sort of highlight in the NL MVP race. Um, and he's right. In limited games, he's only played 30 games um, because he had that whole COVID fiasco at the beginning of the season. So he's only been limited to 30 games. But in those 30 games – He's been extremely good, 11 homers. He's currently tops in the league um, in OBP, slugging and OPS. Um, insane numbers from, you know, again, another one of those really exciting um, and flashy players um, in the future stars of this game. He's been extremely good. And, again, only in 30 games for a Nationals team. He's hit 11 home runs. Yeah, he's, in 30 he's games. He's near the top of – he's near the top. Of <laughs> league and home runs, and he's bagged 368. Yeah. Like, I don't know what else you could ask for him. Right now, he leads the league in on base percentage, slowing percentage, and OPS. He has a 
two five seven OPS. What else can the Nationals need from him? And I think the biggest reason why the Nationals have struggled this year is because one, Strasburg got hurt after signing a big deal, and he's out. He's done for the year. So I think that hurt. But also, Rendon was a big piece of that team because I I said last year that Soto was the top bat, but then you had a guy like Rendon right behind him who could hit for power and hit consistently, and they're lacking that guy. Trey Turner's been terrific this year. He has. He's been great. But I think that when you're looking at that lineup, there's a hole at third base losing Rendon that – I actually thought that they were going to go get Donaldson after when Don't Send with the Angels. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely, definitely a guy that I think we all thought they were going to at least take a look at. So Dom again still having trouble getting in. We're going to move on to the um, American uh, yeah. League. Well, we're also we also still need to talk a little bit about NL Cy Young. So we'll kind of go quick here. We'll go Cy Young we'll go- of the year. Oh, you you want to just go NL predictions and go AL? Yeah, we'll just go because we yeah. still got to do Cy Young and Rookie of the Year. I think for Cy Young and the National League, uh, we'll just kind of be quick about it. I think it's real a lot closer than a lot of people think. Um, but Jacob Degrom, um, over these past few starts, has again just solidified or just has you know proven the fact that you know he's the best pitcher in baseball. It's really not even close. He's a he's got a one point six seven ERA, which is I think one of the lowest in the entire league, but um, you know, Trevor Bauer has been really good this year. You Darvish has really picked up right in the spot last season. Really good. Mm-hmm. He's been really yep. good for the Cubs this year. Definitely. Um, you know, you've got Max Fried, who has been really good for the Braves. Zach Gallon for the Diamondbacks has been has stepped in, has stepped up, and become really the ace of the staff um, in Bumgarner's absence, and you know, in his you know since he's been performing so bad. Um, so a lot of really solid candidates there, but I mean, I think Jacob Degrom has to be, you know, a, once again the um, a- NL Cy Young Award winner um, this season. So that's my thoughts on it. You know, Degrom has Degrom just continues to prove that despite his lack of really help from the offense, he's still dominant. I don't, I honestly don't know if you can go against him. I thought Sonny Gray and Trevor Bauer had terrific arguments, but they're both starting to slip as the Reds are just falling farther and farther behind. So I think DeGrom is going to get his third straight Cy Young, which is yeah. crazy to think. Yeah, exactly. He, I mean, he yeah. is arguably the best pitcher in baseball, and year in and year out, he continues to prove that despite the lack of production he gets while he's on the mound. Definitely. I mean, I, when I say lack of production, offensively. Yeah, no, he's been sort of notorious for, you know, having to pitch with, you know, lack of run support pretty much every time he goes out there. But again, I think he really proved it in his first Cy Young campaign, you know, how much of a flawed statistic wins are. And again, he's shown it this year and he's shown it really every year because he's part of a Mets team that on paper looks like they're a dangerous lineup. And I mean, you know, every every now and then they're going to put up 18 runs like they did last night, but, um, you know, he has always been constantly good regardless of, you know, run support or anything like that. He's always just remained consistent and that's what you want out of a starting pitcher. And he's sort of been the poster child for that for these past three seasons. And that's part of the reason why he's just been probably the best pitcher in the league. We're going to move to um, national league rookie of the year. And again, I think it's, I think it's kind of, um, a one-man race here with uh, Jake Cronenworth of the Padres, who has four homers this year. He's batting 315 with a 909 OPS. He's got 11 doubles, 41 hits in 40 games as well. Um, he really has played pretty much – he's played a good chunk of the season. He's almost played the entire season with them. Um, where he's been up with the big league club, I'm pretty sure, since um, their first or second series. Dom would probably know more about that. Um, he's provided a lot of value for them on defense. Um, he's played multiple positions very well, but at the plate, he's definitely been stroking he's it. He's really been a st- he's really been a staple for them at second base. Definitely and asking Dom, talking to Dom about it. The one position he was really worried about the past couple of years was mainly second base. Yeah, and Cronenworth is now that guy at second. And yeah, it's good. they got Profar over the offseason in a trade with the Athletics, but. 
I really like how Cronenworth has stepped in. His versatility is always a plus. Teams Definitely. love versatile players. That's why Whit Merrifield is so valuable. Mm-hmm. Wow, Cronenworth is hitting the ball really well. So, personally, I don't think there's anyone that comes close to him. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty obvious. So, we're going to move to the American League now and talk about the American League MVP, uh, Cy Young, and Rookie of the Year races. And I'm going to start with um, with the point that Dom wants to make talking about Shane Bieber, who – potentially could not only be winning the Cy Young this year in the American League, but also the MVP, which is something that is very rare. It's very rare to see a pitcher win both awards in, in a single season. Um, I think the most recent to do it was uh, Clayton Kershaw. I think it was in 2014. I don't quite remember. I don't know. If J- I don't think Jacob DeGrom did it. But, um, yeah, Shane Bieber has probably been the best pitcher in the entire league this season. Um, again, we talk about how good DeGrom is, but Shane Bieber has sort of cemented himself over the past couple of years um, as one of the top arms in baseball. He's coming off of a season where he had 214 and a third innings pitch and 259 strikeouts this year. And in fact, I think it was last night. Yeah, he's just been so dominant. I think it was last night or just his last start. He became the fastest pitcher to amass 100 strikeouts in a single season. And in 64 and two thirds innings, he leads. At, he actually is tops in innings pitched with 64 and two thirds, strikeouts with 102, ERA at a 1.53, just ridiculous. He's also got seven wins. If you're someone who still values wins, but regardless, he's just been dominant. He's gone out there. He's, um, and he's just he's mowing hitters down. It doesn't really matter which lineup he's facing. He's definitely been. One of the best pitchers. He's been, he's been extremely consistent. Yeah. He the league and wins, which I still think is something that you kind of have to take with a, as a grain of salt. Yeah. But he has the most starts, 10 starts this year, and he has the league's best ERA with 1.53. Mm-hmm. That's insane. Yeah. Just to have a 1.53 ERA in and of itself. Absolutely. Is he's already had 100 true strikeouts. He has the best ERA plus at 307. His whip this year is 0.866. You can't get much better than this. No, you can't. You even can. He's yeah. been insane. He's been and really I good. The argument for him to win MVP. Ultimately, I don't think he gets it, but he is for sure the biggest walk for Cy Young as it can get this year. Definitely. And I mean, I, I I agree with Ryan here in the sense that I don't know if he'll get an MVP, but I definitely think he's in the conversation to say the least. Um, he's also got 14.2 strikeouts per nine. That's, that's ludicrous. The guy's stepped up and he's been extremely nasty and he's definitely confirmed the fact that, you know, he's going to be the ace of this staff for years to come. And for an Indians team that has lost, you know, Kluber, Clevenger, and Trevor Bauer, you know, three really good arms over the over the past yeah. few seasons. They've, you know, Bieber has stepped up as, think, as probably the biggest piece of that rotation. I think it's been insane how mm-hmm. the Indians can trade Kluber, they can trade Clevenger, yeah. they can trade Bauer, and still have one of the league's best rotations. Mm-hmm. It, it blows my mind. The yeah. developmental staff with pitching has to be the best in the league. Definitely. And terrific. Imagine if all those guys were still in Cleveland. Who knows? Honestly. Would want, I would not want to go near the Indians at all with how dumb that rotation would be. And yet they've gotten right. great pieces by trading those guys. So the Indians have done it right, especially with their pitching. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, they've also got Adam Tavalle as well, who's, who's stepping up and been good. They called up Tristan McKenzie, who's – one of the top arms in their farm system. Yeah, he's been very good since he's been called up. You know, really young, going to be good for a very, oh, very yeah. long time for sure. So he's we're going to – too. Mm-hmm. So that's that's Dom's MVP, and I think both of us or all of us agree he's going to run away with at least a oh, sign. There is no doubt he's winning sign. But, no yeah, doubt. but just to quickly highlight other AL MVP candidates. I have one. Really talk about I have, this. I have Jose Abreu. You got I, – I was – I actually kind Hear of – Hear me out. Hear me out. He leads the American League in hits with 55 mm-hmm. and in RBIs with 40. He yep. also has 13 home runs. He leads 
the American League in total bases as well. He's batting 304 with a 347 on base percentage and a slugging percentage of 586. Yeah. He has been a huge piece of that lineup. And he's a huge reason why you've seen the White Sox take over and play as well as they've been playing because mm-hmm. he has just turned it on. Absolutely. I think that he has a legit argument to win MVP this year. Yeah, one of, if not the most underrated player in baseball since he has come into the league. And you saw the deal he took to stay in yeah. Chicago. Yeah. He's just proving that he could have gotten so much more if he would have left. Exactly. Yeah. He's just been so consistent for them ever since he was called up. You know, he's always he's a guy who – Power, guy who gets yeah. driving runs. Guaranteed 25-plus homers, 80, 85 to 100-plus RBIs. You know, just a really good hitter. And, again, he's proven that this year, putting up MVP numbers. He in also got to talk a little bit about – In five of his first six seasons, he has over 100 RBIs, including leading the league last year in RBIs with 123. Yeah, very, very good. And, and uh, I believe it was 2018, he only had 78 RBIs because he – did he, he only played 120 ish games, 120, 130 games. Mm-hmm. If he were playing the rest of the season, he probably would have hit that mark. Yeah, exactly. So um, he's been consistent. He's been terrific for the White Sox. I think that he could get the MVP nod. Definitely. I think you also got to talk about Luke Voigt at the Yankees. Who oh, he's been terrific. The league in home runs with 16. He's batting 285 for an injury um, plagued Yankee lineup that has, you know, seen some of their top stars, you know, consistently hit the I be consistently hitting the IL with um, injuries like judge and Stanton. He's batting 285 again with 16 homers. He's got a 982 OPS. He's by and large probably been the best hitter in that entire lineup for them. Um, so you definitely he, got to consider him for an MVP. He has kept, he has kept that Yankees team afloat. Mm-hmm. He's put him on his back and he's carried them through all of the injuries and just led and carried the load offensively. I've been yeah. extremely impressed with Luke Voigt. He has 43 hits on the year. 16 of them are home runs, which is insane. The one thing about Voight, though, is that he has struck out 40 times. Mm -hmm. But he is still hitting – excuse my language. He's hitting the crap out of the ball. Yeah. Yeah, he's been very good. Yeah, I think think he's the other guy that deserves a mention for the MVP award. Absolutely. And then you also – obviously, it feels like this is just, you know – you know, it's a constant when it comes to, you know, the American League MVP race. But Mike Trout, again, has submitted himself in the conversation. You can't really talk about this without talking about him. Again, tied with Voight for the lead, league lead in homers with 16, 39 ribbies, uh, 303 average. He's been very good for an Angels team that struggled this year. So those are definitely the three guys I think, in my opinion, you got to keep in mind for the American League MVP. I don't really know who's going to get it. I do agree with Bieber possibly being a good candidate. Um, we're not even going to talk about Cy Young because I think we all agree that yeah. Bieber is definitely the guy. I think it's insane yeah. how there's never a year Mike Trout is not in the MVP mm-hmm. conversation. He's tied for the league leading home runs. He leads the AL in runs. He's batting 303 with a 400 on base percentage. Mm-hmm. What else can you ask? It's very him? good. You know, just His very OPS good. plus is 184. He, and the crazy part is, a center fielder has been walked intentionally four times this year. I know that's a weird stat to bring up, but it's kind of insane. You never see that from a center fielder. That just shows how dynamic and how incredible Mike Trout is as a player. Yeah, he's just the modern day, you know, Mickey Mantle. Yeah. I think if you ask me, you know, he's gotten drawn a lot of comps to him. Um, I think ever since he came up, he's just been so good, so consistent. Um, he's a future Hall of Famer, and you know, oh, first ballot for sure. Um, he could so be a, yeah. a unanimous Hall of Famer. So yeah, definitely, those are the guys to look out for when it comes to the MVP. And then Cy Young race, obviously Bieber. I mean, you can talk about like, you know, other guys like you know, Kenta Maeda has been pretty good. I think Maeda has been really good. Maeda has been really good. Um, can we talk about Garrett Cole's struggles? Besides, outside of yesterday's terrific performance, he has not been Garrett Cole. Yeah, he hasn't and, – and, again, I think – I really think it's because, you know, going to the Yankees and being with the Knicks. I expected team, him to take a step back because he's yeah. playing, he's playing in a small ballpark. He's playing in a head of park. I didn't expect him to be struggling this much. Yeah. But regardless of his struggles, he's getting hot at the right time, and 
that's definitely what the Yankees need from him. So, yeah, that's definitely a couple guys to consider in the Cy Young. But Rookie of the Year is probably my favorite awards race. And it's so close. And it's very close. It's two guys, really, that um, you have to talk about. Kyle Lewis of the Mariners and then Luis Robert of the Chicago White Sox. Both men for the entire season have really been neck and neck in that race. I really don't know who to pick. I think Kyle Lewis is probably the guy I'd take with the slight edge over Robert. Robert is um, definitely the guy to go with when it comes to power stats, but Kyle Lewis has been just such a good hitter. Yeah, he's been a good defender. Been, and again, yeah. for a Mariners team that's just been showcasing, you know, what their future is going to look like, calling up all these young stars or all it's these cornerstone for them, young future stars like you know Evan White, who they signed to a six-year contract. Yeah, um, you know they called up him um, last year as a September call-up. You know they've made him the everyday guy in center as it should be. Yeah. You know, again, the Mariners are just kind of showcasing what their future is going to look like. And Kyle Lewis, like you said, is definitely a cornerstone of that. Yeah. So I think he's my um, MVP, um, rookie of the year pick. But he's my pick too. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's because of how cons- how he's been more consistent with his hitting. When you want to look at power, go Luis Robert. Mm-hmm. But look at Kyle Lewis. He's batting 299 with nine home runs, which is more than Robert, with 23 RBIs and 47 hits. He's he's been huge for the Mariners this year, and the reason why they're not far behind the Astros. Mm-hmm. But like Very Void, Kyle Lewis strikes out a lot. He struck out, I think I read it, forty seven times this year, in forty three games. That's so, quite a bit. So I think that that has an effect. But honestly, he's been much more consistent to where I have to pick Kyle Lewis, as Luis Robert is only batting two sixty. And he struck out 55 times. The only yeah. thing Robert has over him is RBIs with 27. He, also, home runs with he also has 11 homers. He leads yeah. all he's at that mark. Yeah, he, and you expected that. He's mm-hmm. a power guy. When you want power, you go to Luis Robert. And earlier, yeah. I, earlier I said Kyle Lewis had more home runs. I don't know what I was looking at. I misspoke. Yeah, there. no. Yeah, but, it's all good. Yeah, but, but Robert, yeah. he's a power hitter. He's a Robert terrific power guy. Hitter. Who, really tore up the minor leagues in his yeah. career. Probably one of the better minor league players in recent memory. You know, everyone was hyping him up as like the next Mike Trout, everyone was kind of saying coming in. He definitely has shown flashes of, you know, really good, you know, how talented and how skilled he can be, not only at the plate, but in the field. Oh, he yeah. has great speed. And yeah. He's a great fielder. Yeah. Right? He can highlight real catches out in the outfield for the he's White Sox. He's a piece for the White Sox. He's going to yeah. be a key cornerstone for them for years to come and they're already super young when they got Eloy Jimenez, Yohan Moncada they've got so many guys while you mix in their veteran guys with Abreu Tim Anderson, mm-hmm. Omar Mazzara, Yasmani Grandal Edwin Encarnacion this team has levels of youth that are playing well and levels of veteran leadership that are playing well as, as well and that's why I think they have been so dominant over the past couple months. Absolutely. And so, again, definitely a um, awards race to keep your eye on is that uh, American League Rookie of the Year race. It's really between both these guys. Right. Right. I have um, Kyle Lewis um, with the edge in that. Um, but, again, definitely keep your eye on it. Luis yeah. Robert and Kyle Lewis are probably going to be faces of their respective franchises for a very long time for years to come. Exactly. Unfortunately, Dom was not able to join us. I think his Wi-Fi crashed or whatever. But yeah, his, um, he told me before the show, his Wi-Fi, they're, they're like repairing it, and he was yeah. nervous about his hotspot being strong enough, and it it wasn't, but yeah. All right. Anyway, we, um, we thank you for joining us. Um, if you weren't able to catch it live, this will be up on YouTube the second we end this recording. And on Spotify. Yeah, and on Spotify, and I think it's on Twitter, correct? Yes, it will be. It will yeah. be we'll so Twitter. basically, every given you know place where you could possibly stream a video, that's where it's probably going to be. Yeah. So we thank you for joining us. Um, it was a really good episode. And again, unfortunately, Dom was not able to be here, but we may do without him. So again, thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you next week. See you next week, guys.